We're continuing with Thoreau's encounter with the Bible quote. <laughs> For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Mark 8, 36. <laughs> Page 367. The irony of it all pierced Thoreau to the quick. He was earning... A living telling audiences to, quote, get your living by loving, unquote, but hated what he was doing. It cost him everything he loved. This is when he was on the lecture circuit. <laughs> on December 6th, after writing, of, after days of writing and a whirl of engagements, he collapsed into a window seat on the train to Providence and rooted on the landscape, quote, I see thick ice and boys skating all the way to Providence, but no, not when it froze. I have been so busy writing my lecture. <laughs> it was as if, as he feared in September. If I go abroad lecturing, how shall I ever recover the lost winter? Hmm. But he should soldiered on. The Providence organizers specified that given the, quote, outrages of slavery, unquote, their speakers must emphasize reform. Now they're telling him what to do. <laughs> They invited Theodore Parker, Wendell Phillips, and William Lloyd Garrison, and T.W. Higginson, ranking Thoreau with the era's greatest reform speakers. <laughs> the audience would have loved this great barn burner, quote, slavery in Massachusetts, unquote. But Thoreau, who did not repeat published material, gave them, quote, what shall it profit, unquote, instead? Less fire, more philosophy. Her reaction was cool, and Thoreau left deeply unhappy. Quote, I fail to get even the attention of the mass. I should suit them better if I suited myself less, unquote. They wanted not the original, but the familiar. Quote, you cannot interest them except as you are like them and sympathize with them. Unquote. The only saving grace. You like that phrase, saving grace. The only saving grace was the providential appearance of H.G.O. Blake's best friend, Theo Brown, knowing there was some Worcester soil there, saved his words from falling on stony ground. <laughs> Worcester. Worcester. That's a town in Massachusetts. <laughs> Even stony ground might yield a little fruit, though. In Providence, that meant Meeting Emerson's protege, Charles King Newcomb, he of the, quote, the two Dolans, who took throw to see Roger Williams Rock and the old fort at Narragansett Bay. That's in uh, Rhode Island. But Thoreau couldn't get rid of the bad taste in his mouth. He had cheapened himself, exhausted himself trying to become a popular lecturer. He's a failure at becoming popular, I think. <laughs> and for what? Twice now, audiences in major cities had yawned at his best new material. The whole enterprise was a failure. Worst, it took away what he treasured above all else, his freedom to walk daily into nature to see what each new day brought forth. Quote, winter has come unnoticed by me, he quoted. He sulked away on his return from Providence. Better to write books. 
Hmm. He's thinking of just doing like YouTube readings and not doing lectures. Uh -huh. Let his audience be shifted that way. Better they come to him than he go to them. And with that resolution, his plans for a big Western lecture tour evaporated. So he's not going to Akron, Ohio. <laughs> he's skipping Ohio. Such grand tours worked for Emerson, who made them annually. But this was the last time Thoreau sought a lecture engagement outside New England. Meanwhile, he honored the commitments he already made, giving, quote, what shall it profit, unquote, to the New Bedford Lyceum the day after Christmas, and to the Nantucket Athenium two days later. Nantucket is that island. You know Nantucket. Fortunately, given his despairing mood, both places gave him good reasons not to give up altogether. But New Bedford was Daniel Rickickson's neighborhood, and sure enough, the instant Rickinson heard Thoreau was coming, he whipped out the letter he'd shelled back in October, added a note, inviting Thoreau to stay with him, and dropped it in the mail. Thoreau promptly accepted, and by return mail, Rickinson sent instructions to take the evening train on Christmas Day. Instructions that Rickinson promptly forgot. Hmm. On Christmas morning, 1854, he rushed to meet the noon train, only to return home disappointed. Thoreau, meanwhile, arrived on the evening train, as instructed, and found no one there to meet him. Rickon, so he didn't have a cell phone. Huh? How do you meet somebody? You have to write a letter. You say, meet me. <laughs> Why didn't he use his cell phone? <laughs> Rickon, just a clearing the snow off his front steps when he saw, quote, a man walking up the carriage road carrying a portmanteau in one hand and an umbrella in the other. He was dressed in a long overcoat of dark color and wore a dark soft hat. A peddler of small wares, he was saying, but the peddler walked up to him and stopped. Quote, you do not know me, unquote, said the stranger. Quote, it was at once flashed on my mind that the person before me was my correspondent, whom I had expected in the morning, and who, in my imagination, had figured as a stout and robust person instead of the small and rather inferior-looking man before me. However, I concealed my disappointment and went at once replied, I presume this is Mr. Thoreau. <laughs> I think he was a disappointment. Okay. Well, out of this ludicrous series of miscues, uh, miscues, uh -huh, was born a remarkable friendship. Rickinson was a wealthy Quaker who had given up a career in law to live on the fortune that his great grandfather had made in the whaling industry. I think you can live your life. Uh, on the fortune of your great grandfather from whaling. Well, like that. But the source of the like funds why. is immoral in some way. <laughs> he was a perennial student and well meaning dilettante, dabbling in a dozen pastimes writer, poet, local historian, naturalist, reformer abolitionist, and a nervous hypochondriac who spent most of his waking hours in his shanty, a writer's cabin warmed by an open fire and filled with books and papers. Why don't we get a cabin with books and papers and a fire? Huh? Why can't we have a cabin? Huh? Hmm? We could replicate. Uh, Walden almost. We could have a cabin by a pond. 
They should have a Walden Pond resort, not a resort. You can make a Walden Pond uh, vacation center. <laughs> But you'd have to walk a mile to town to get food and shit. Mm -hmm. So you can't have it on site. Mm -hmm. hmm. Filled with books, with an open fire and papers. A few feet away stood Brook Lawn, a fine large family home, presided over by his wife. <laughs> See, you could have a fine, large family house, and only a little ways away, I could have a shanty, a writer's cabin, lined by open fire, and filled with books. <laughs> See, I could have all my books in this little cabin, and you would have the fine family home, and it would be separated by outdoors. Hmm. That would be perfect. By his wife, Louisa Riconson, and made lively by their four children, Arthur, Walton, who became a well-known sculptor, and Anna and Emma, as he and Thoreau talked into the night. Daniel's disappointment melted away. The effect on Henry was instantaneous. Quote, I went to walk in the woods with Art. It was wonderfully pleasant and warm and pleasant. I felt the winter breaking up in me, and if I had been at home, I should have tried to write poetry. Maybe he is the great friend <laughs> in our previous reading of the poems. Uh, he could be a great friend. He was a great friend. Dear Walden, a cheery Ricon song saluted Henry a week later. They call him Dear Walton, Walden. Already inviting a return visit, Thoreau bounced back a sunny reply. In a flash, the two were old friends, intimate, open, and relaxed, teasing each other in not one moment, and the next finally laughing off their frequent and mutual annoyances. <laughs> so this reading started out kind of sad. <laughs> with him failing at his TED Talks. <laughs> and then he met one great friend. Hmm. That is so cool. Hmm. Hmm. Daniel Rickonson. <laughs> hmm. I read the 370. And uh, chapter 9 of Henry David Thoreau, A Life. What do you think of that? You get, you might meet one receptive person on the lecture tour. You can give a lectures all across the country and at least reach one person if you're lucky. <laughs> the little prince. What about him? He is the little prince. Oh, the little prince finds an one friend. Oh, he had more friends, I suppose, but not on the lecture circuit. <laughs> mm. It's hard to please people at a lecture because they want you to say what they want to hear. They wanted him to say what they wanted to hear. <laughs> 